Welcome to Walk in the Shadows, Series 1, Episode 1 of Noisy Spirits, The Poltergeist Phenomenon, with me, your host, Tim Woolworth. In this episode, I'll walk you through the shadowy topic of poltergeists as we explore two historical cases in depth and briefly touch upon some theory about poltergeist manifestations. In 1962, there was a short article published in the Los Angeles Times that featured an Indianapolis family living with a daily nightmare. The Beck family were being attacked by an unseen, maleficent force in their home that left them terrified. For an unknown reason, the force loved to destroy glass. At any given time, various pieces of glassware would mysteriously fly off shelves and shatter. In a move that defied physics, one glass vessel flew around a 90-degree corner before shattering at the mother's feet. In a common theme throughout this series, the Beck family called in the police. The mysterious activity showed no regard for the law, as glass was destroyed in their presence. In fact, the violent force physically struck a police officer investigating the scene with a flying piece of glassware. The mother and teenage daughter reported to the police that all types of glass had been destroyed, including crystal vases, goblets, drinking glasses, ashtrays, figurines, and other various pieces. Even more disconcerting was that the mother and teenage daughter both felt stinging pains in their arms one night. Upon looking, they found small puncture wounds not caused by any glass. It was an enigmatic mystery that had drawn blood. The events being witnessed by several credible individuals who were not part of the Beck family, made national news. It was obvious that something very strange was occurring in the Beck house. As incredible as this event sounds, it is just one of thousands of very well-documented cases of like activity. While the driving force behind these events is still being researched to this day, it is still very important to note that regardless of a lack of scientific explanation, something real, something bizarre, has happened in these cases. As to what that something might be, remains a mystery of the first degree. In this series, we will explore similar well-documented, uncanny activity complete with credible witnesses of what is commonly referred to as poltergeist phenomenon. To lay the groundwork for the modern case files we'll dig into, we must first go back in time, almost 1,200 years, to explore a classic poltergeist case from medieval Bavaria. The first in-depth, written recording of poltergeist phenomena began with a literal bang in the sleepy farming town of Bingen on Rhine in the year 858. While there are even earlier reports of poltergeist events, they do not have the documentation that the Bingen case has, so we won't cover them on this episode. A farmer, whose name has been lost to history, heard a loud sound against the side of his farmhouse. Being concerned for his property, the farmer immediately went outside to find the source of the noise. Once he stepped outside, he saw small rocks intermittently pelting the side of his house like they were being thrown from a distance. Despite looking from bush to barn for a culprit, he could not locate one. Unfortunately for the farmer, this was not a one-off occurrence. In addition to stones pelting the side of the house, other rocks of various sizes began raining down upon the farmhouse roof. Even more disconcerting than that, sometimes rocks would find their way through open windows. Once, Rocks even struck the farmer while he was lying awake in bed. As for the farmer, tales say that the farmer was rather ornery. Being a curmudgeon has its drawbacks, and in a small farming community, especially so. It has been said that his neighbors all around disliked him. From the farmer's point of view, it was quite plausible that a neighbor was the cause of this disquiet. But as more rocks at the side of the house, he eventually caught something unusual in action when investigating the activity. The rocks were materializing from the air itself. For a couple weeks, this anomaly continued as a very unusual annoyance with no major damage to the home or his family. Then there was a dramatic shift. The activity became louder, more expansive, and much more menacing. The wall shook and shuddered. It sounded as if a heavily weighted invisible sledgehammer was slammed against the walls of his house again and again at all hours. The farmer, nor his family, consisting of his wife and at least one teenage daughter, were able to properly sleep as the pounding, the banging, kept them up all night. The thumping continued unabated, and unfortunately for this family, the activity increased yet again. 
It was no longer the house that was the sole target of these spectral attacks, but the farmer himself. He could, at any given time, become the recipient of the vicious pelting with various small stones both inside and outside of his home. It was as if he was being followed by an invisible entity that was having fun at the cost of his physical pain and mental suffering. In addition to stones attacking his person, there were other events that negatively affected the farmer. The crops that were his livelihood mysteriously caught fire and were unsalvageable. The dairy cows from which he sold milk mysteriously dried up. Most unfortunately, the bulk of his cattle died from a mysterious wasting disease. I'm not saying that these things are attributable to the poltergeist attack the family was living under, but it is obvious from historical records that several facets of this farmer's life were falling apart. With this level of activity, it is easy to see how the farmer could associate all of these things as being from a single cause. In the ninth century, there could only be one thing to blame for everything. Demons. If you turn on a television ghost show, or watch YouTube videos of ghost hunters in the field today, demons are still a catch-all reason for a myriad of mysteriousness. Apparently not much has changed in the last 1200 years. If we can still blame demons today for even innocuous hauntings, it's easy to see why the farmer thought it was a demon, especially in a small town and an age where religion reigned supreme. And then the entity that made his life miserable one-upped itself again when it started doing something that is well known in demonic lore. It began talking. At a moment when the locals were dropping in on the farmer regularly, vying to get a glimpse of the supernatural in action, the entity decided to speak. Its voice boomed audibly, filling the farmhouse with loud reverberation and dreadful accusation. The invisible threat accused the farmer of seducing a local teenage girl whose name has also been lost to history. The neighbors were aghast. They had suspected the farmer of such a dishonorable deed, and now it had been confirmed by the unseen guest in the farmhouse. Rumors swirled as to who the girl may be. Some of the townsfolk, said he had also lain with his teenage daughter. In such a small village, this accusation and subsequent rumors had devastating effects for the farmer. His neighbors ostracized him, leaving him with no one other than his family for advice at a much-needed time. I cannot imagine the stress he was put under. His crops and cattle were failing, his neighbors wouldn't talk to him, and the entity was wreaking havoc on his home, his work, and his social integrity. This led him to pursue the one path he had left, a path that many would take if put in the same situation today. He pleaded for help from a higher power. In 9th century Bingen, the given proxy for a higher power was the local sect of Carolingian monks. Upon traveling to their monastery, the farmer explained his situation and asked for any help they could offer. A priest took up the call and examined the situation at the farmhouse. The priest, upon noting the activity present, felt that he was not up to the task by himself, so he sent a letter to the Bishop of Mainz. In this letter, the priest detailed what he had witnessed and requested experts to help with the case via an exorcism. The bishop sent a team of exorcists to the home with the tools of exorcism in hand, relics, holy water, and of course, the Bible. In addition to the necessary tools, the God Squad were given detailed instructions about the rites of exorcism that were to be followed. We know all this because the letter that requested help from the bishop and the resulting dispatch of exorcists to the home was recorded in the Episcopal Annals of Mainz and can still be read today. The exorcist team sprinkled holy water throughout the property, and the rites of exorcism were thus begun. In 9th century Bavaria, this was very big news. Naturally, as people are wont to do when there is a big event, the townsfolk gathered outside of the property to witness something so rare and so phenomenal the tales of it would be passed down through the generations. While gathered, watching the exorcism take place, someone in the crowd began singing a religious hymn. The gathered townsfolk followed, and the chorus was strengthened in volume and intent. We're not sure if it was the song, or the good-natured intent of the townsfolk, but this hymn caused the poltergeist activity to increase dramatically. The song seemingly incensed the poltergeist, and it let it be known that it wasn't happy. 
Over the gathered crowd of singing neighbors, it began to rain furiously. Only this rain wasn't water. It was a rain of pebbles and small-sized stones. During the attack, the unseen guest's voice boomed once more with another accusation. It stated that the lead exorcist from Mainz was an adulterer. He had gone against his vows with women he had lusted after. At that moment, faced with a personal attack on character and the overwhelming power of falling stones, the exorcism was discontinued. The rain of stones continued unabated, though, and the townsfolk scattered out of fear. Unfortunately, the Episcopal annals have no record as to what happened after this point to the farmer, his family, nor the farmhouse. This is quite common in medieval history. We are left with the folklore and bits of the story, but no satisfactory conclusion. The resulting outcome of the first poltergeist on official record is, unfortunately, as dark as the era from whence it came. The next case I'll cover is almost a full 1,000 years after the Bingen Farmhouse event. There are numerous cases during the interim that have been written about, but I wanted to shift to a more modern, well-documented case to lay the groundwork for current thoughts about the poltergeist phenomenon. The following quote is the testimony of Cesare Lombroso. He published this in his excellent and well-received book written about his psychical investigations entitled, After Death, What? And I quote, There was a deep wine cellar, the access to which was obtained by means of a long stairway and a passageway. The people informed me that they noticed that whenever anyone entered the cellar, the bottles began to be broken. I entered it first in the dark, and sure enough, I heard the breaking of glasses and the rolling of bottles under my feet. I thereupon lit up the place. The bottles were massed together upon five shelves, one over the other. In the middle of the room was a rude table. I had six lighted candles placed upon this, on the supposition that the spiritualist phenomena would cease in bright light. On the contrary, I saw three empty bottles which stood upright on the floor spin along as if twirled by a finger and break to pieces near the table. To avoid a possible trick, I carefully examined by the light of a large candle and touched with my hand all the full bottles standing on the shelves and ascertained there were no wire or strings that might explain the movements. After a few minutes, two bottles, then four, and later others on the second and third shelves separated themselves from the rest and fell to the floor without any violent motion but rather as if they'd been lifted down by someone, and after the descent, rather than fall, six burst upon the wet floor already drenched with wine and two remained intact. A quarter of an hour afterwards, three others from the last compartment fell and were broken on the floor. Then I turned to leave the cellar. As I was on the point of going out, I heard the breaking of another bottle on the floor. When the door was shut, all became quiet. Before we get into Lombroso's investigation of the poltergeist and the reason for the quote I just read, I'll give you a little history on this very influential individual. Despite the grounded, phenomenal investigations that he wrote about in his book, Lombroso will forever be known in another field that has nothing to do with the paranormal. In fact, when I was still at university, Lombroso was brought up as a cautionary tale in two different courses, one course on modernity and the other in psychology. Lombroso was a professor of psychology at Pavia in Italy in the mid-19th century. His practice led him to the title which he will always be remembered for, Father of Criminology. In fact, he invented the word criminology. As a materialist who studied criminals and the insane in an asylum in Pizarro, he did not believe that any form of insanity was an illness of the mind. The idea of the mind does not exist within the confines of strict materialism, but the brain does. Lombroso felt that any psychiatric disorder can only be a physical disorder of the brain material itself. For years, he examined the brain fiber of those who had died in the asylum, trying to track down what he called the germ of insanity, but he never found it. We understand now that most mental disorders do not create observable biological changes in the brain. As Lombroso examined corpse after corpse, he began to associate certain physical features of the skull with madness. He then studied living subjects 
and tried to match the way a person looked to the type of insanity they may suffer from. Once he felt that he had a grounded approach, he started to apply the same techniques to criminals. Through his personal medical doctrine that there must be a physical cause for everything, he believed strongly that the physical traits of a person should therefore tell you about that person. Much like sorting through brain fibers, all he had to do was find the association. We still do that today when we see a photo of someone online or on the news, and we say to ourselves that they look like a criminal or that they look crazy. This is probably because the only time we ever see their image is when it's linked to an article about that person being in legal trouble. Much like Lombroso only studied criminals and the insane to reach his nebulous conclusions. Lombroso used unscientific mechanisms like phrenology and physiognomy to determine who would be a criminal. If you haven't heard those terms before, basically Lombroso thought he could explain a person's personality and behavior based solely upon their skull and facial features. It was the first attempt at criminal profiling based upon facial recognition. He felt that a criminal was a throwback to when humanity still lived in caves. A large forehead, close-knit eyebrows, a large jaw, muscular, all of these things denoted criminal tendencies according to his synopsis of physical traits. Although he was trying to do positive social science, history is not kind to Lombroso. His ideas had power and took off across the world, influencing how police departments conducted investigations in several countries. Undoubtedly, innocent people were jailed and unfortunately executed based upon his methodologies for determining criminality. It also had severe repercussions for helping to reinforce racism and ethnic discrimination. Despite his glaring oversights as a criminologist, Lombroso's work as a psychical investigator was, and still remains steadfast. This is one area where his powers of acute observation and analysis were put to good use. Lombroso investigated mediums, psychics, and haunted locations with a critical eye trained to look at the minutia other investigators may have overlooked. He was quite renowned for this. He even developed equipment that he felt would help him to measure the energies responsible for mediumship and hauntings. Lombroso worked with some of the best psychical researchers of the early 19th century to try to unravel the mysterious. The testimony that I quoted earlier was an integral part of his write-up about his investigation of an inn owned by Signor Fumero, located at number 6 Via Bava in Turin, Italy. In 1900, Lombroso had read about the haunted events at the inn via a newspaper, and it piqued his interest. Lombroso was in tour and investigating a medium, so he went to the inn to speak with the proprietor about the haunting. When Lombroso asked Fumero if there was any truth to the rumored events published about in the newspaper, Fumero looked at him and said that the inn suffered through a lot of haunted activity. But it was now over. Lombroso asked when the activity stopped. Fumero looked at him and said the famous Professor Lombroso had come to investigate the inn and the ghost had left the premises as a result. Taken aback a little, Lombroso looked at Fumero and said, You interest me extremely. Let me introduce myself. And then handed the proprietor his card, which had the name Cesare Lombroso upon it. Fumero, in what I can imagine was a fit of apologetic embarrassment, said that the Italian police had been in the house already and had borne witness to the paranormal events. They threatened Signor Fumero by saying that unless the events were stopped immediately, he would be arrested. To make it seem like the events had stopped, Fumero had concocted a fraudulent story for the press that Cesare Lombroso had come and gone already, solving the mystery of the ghost. After Signor Fumero apologized to Cesare for using his name, Lombroso asked if the events were still happening. Signor Fumero looked relieved. He told Lombroso that the activity was still present. In fact, it was worse than ever, and informed him of where the paranormal forces were still wreaking havoc at the inn. There were ample reports of wine bottles moving, and much to the chagrin of the wine cellar owners, shattering on their own in the cellar. The kitchen staff reported that the utensils would move on their own and were often found broken. The servant girls' garments would twist up into a ball and wind up on the first floor below their second floor quarters. Once, a vase full of flowers that was set upon the ample molding above a door frame was then witnessed being moved through the air to a table unassisted. The place was so haunted that even the furniture behaved erratically, 
Several chairs and a table were broken over the course of a few short weeks. Initially, the inn owner had sought out help from both the police and a priest. The priest offered a blessing. When a police officer first investigated, a very large bottle full of wine burst at his feet in the wine cellar. Also in the presence of the police, a little staircase ladder used for getting wine from the higher shelves was slowly lowered to the floor, gently, on its own, from its position resting against a wall. Fumero kept a gun in the cellar, and the gun was witnessed flying across the room to the opposite corner. Luckily, the gun did not fire. A staff member was attacked when two bottles of wine were propelled off a high shelf onto a porter's back, leaving his back and elbow severely bruised. Events at the inn were starting to get dangerous. Despite all this, those Fumero had reached out to for help ignored the events at the inn, and remember, the police had told Fumero to put an end to the events or face being arrested. The Fumero family was at their wit's end. Cesare Lombroso, already known for his work in Italy with other cases, arrived at precisely the right time. Lombroso immediately went to work trying to solve the mystery of the inn. He spent several days at the inn observing and interviewing. He focused upon investigating the inn's wine shop and the deep wine cellar to which it was connected. To figure out the root cause, Lombroso approached the haunted events through keen observation and documentation. He tracked and established the patterns of people present, the affected items, and the locations where the inexplicable had occurred. Ultimately, Lombroso wound up solving the question as to what was causing the haunting in a little over three weeks. The investigation was one of the very first modern, well-documented case files into what we now refer to colloquially as poltergeist phenomena. Lombroso found what countless other households and businesses have discovered since at least the first century. When there is an invisible roommate that upends everything, bedlam can reign supreme until one finds a way to remove the entity. To solve the case, Lombroso wanted to explore if any of the people present were mediums who were unwittingly affecting the environment. He systematically began removing residents one at a time for one to two days and observing for activity. If nothing changed, and phenomena were still occurring, the person was brought back and another was removed. Finally, all activity ceased on the third attempt at removing a resident. This resident was an employee that lived in the servants' quarters attached to the wine cellar. He was a tall, lanky, 13-year-old waiter whose job it was to serve wine from the cellar. Lombroso inadvertently helped to reify the fledgling concept shared by continental psychical investigators that with poltergeist phenomenon, the activity may center around a person, not a place. While the ideas Lombroso put forth for the field of criminology are very wrong by any standard, his ideas about a person being the focal point of a poltergeist eruption has become the bedrock of investigating poltergeist phenomena. I will refer to the person being the focal point of the poltergeist events with terms like agent, focal, or focus from here on out in this series. All of these terms, for purposes of this podcast, are interchangeable. When Lombroso published upon this in 1909, he classified the events as being the result of the 13-year-old server's pseudo-mediumistic ability. Lombroso believed that the activity throughout the inn was a result of the server's unrealized ability as a medium. Lombroso was also really close to the mark with this assumption as later psychical investigations have revealed. Near the end of his life, Lombroso was having trouble grappling with the experience he had at the inn and other cases he had investigated. He experienced things that challenged his belief in strict materialism. He could not accept the spiritualistic theory of life after death, but he resigned himself to believe in things that were outside of the physical realm. He stated in a letter that, I am ashamed and sorrowful that with so much obstinacy I have contested the possibility of the so-called spiritualistic facts. I say the facts, for I am inclined to reject the spiritualistic theory, but the facts exist, and as regards facts, I glory in saying that I am their slave. If you've listened carefully, you may have noted something that was present at the three poltergeist events we've touched upon in this episode. We will now start to explore a current theory about poltergeist phenomena, which may cast a little light on the three cases mentioned thus far. In subsequent episodes, we will explore the theory a little more, 
to create a fuller picture of the poltergeist phenomena for you. Back in the era of the Bingen Farmhouse event, the term poltergeist did not exist. The events that took place at Bingen and other locations scattered throughout time were naively referred to as demonic or spirit attacks due to a lack of a more specific term. In fact, the term poltergeist wasn't first used until 1848, which is just shy of a full millennium after the Bingen Farmhouse Poltergeist event. You may have heard the term poltergeist is German for noisy ghost or noisy spirit. It comes from the German word poltern, which means to crash, knock, or rant, and geist, which translates to spirit. Even though the word poltergeist was coined in the mid-19th century, it did not become part of parlance outside of psychical investigations until the late 1920s when a famed paranormal investigator began using the term in newspapers and mass market books, specifically in a case we'll cover in the next episode of this series. As you may have already figured out, poltergeist wasn't a term in common use when Lombroso published in 1909, which is why he ascribed the events to the server's pseudo-mediumistic ability. After hearing about a couple cases over a millennium apart, you may be asking yourself an important question right now. How can we distinguish between a poltergeist case and a typical haunting? A poltergeist eruption is the characteristic of person-centeredness. This phenomenon is often found in cases where the focal person has a stressful relationship with someone at the location, or anger caused due to interactions with a third party that are carried to the location by the focal person. As the agent for activity, the person who is the center of a poltergeist eruption will often find that the haunted occurrences will follow them, even if they change residences. In most cases, once the focal person for the eruption leaves, the events cease entirely. The idea put forth in the mid-20th century was that poltergeist activity primarily centered around an adolescent. The eruptions of activity happen via a burst of the adolescent's repressed psyche, which somehow manifests in physical form. Teens and preteens appear to be the dominant energy source for the poltergeist occurrence. If you have experienced puberty, you know all about outbursts. It is posited that if unrestrained and currently unquantifiable emotional energy lashes out in one fell swoop, it may be the cause of poltergeist activity. An overwhelming percentage of poltergeist cases happen when there's a 10 to 20 year old person present, and it is very rare to find a poltergeist case centered on a person over 20 years old. If you have ever seen how poltergeist activity is represented by the media, you may have seen objects flying around the room. Also known by its acronym PK, psychokinesis is the term parapsychologists use to describe an object put into physical motion without a physical force being applied to it. Psychokinesis is made up of two Greek words, psyche, which means mind or soul, and kinesis, which translates to movement. Psychokinesis, the force behind an object's motion, such as a vase full of flowers moving across the room, originates, without intention, from the mind of the focal person. The origination of psychokinesis without intent from a focal person is the dominant belief of what constitutes a poltergeist-like haunting. We still have no idea what forces constitute psychokinesis, nor how it originates and disperses. What is known is that a force does exist. It has been witnessed and documented by credible scientists both in lab settings and in the field for over a century. If psychokinesis is the underlying cause of the poltergeist phenomenon, then its exertion during a poltergeist eruption is far greater than has ever been observed in a lab. That in and of itself makes the poltergeist phenomena most intriguing. Based upon the idea of psychokinesis being present during a poltergeist manifestation, in the mid-20th century, William Roll applied the term recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis, abbreviated as RSPK, to poltergeist eruptions. RSPK is involuntary, recurring, spontaneous, and of the mind. More importantly, once poltergeist phenomena had a classification, it wholly removed the idea of a third-party ghost, spirit, demon, etc. is being responsible for the events. Hauntings, on the other hand, are place-centered as the focal point, not person-centered. A haunted location can bear witness to a spirit and all of its trappings, or a menagerie thereof, over the course of several decades. One of the interesting observations about poltergeist eruptions is that they often manifest much like a haunting at first. Footsteps are heard, then knocks or raps, cold spots may even be present. Even though these things are hallmarks of a haunting and poltergeist eruptions, the big difference between a haunting and a poltergeist eruption is that an apparition is almost never witnessed in a poltergeist infestation, 
whereas they are most certainly associated with a haunting. It is also important to note that a haunting usually occurs completely independent of its observers, whereas in a poltergeist eruption, people are the target and origination. In the next episode of Walk in the Shadows, we will dig into a couple cases that are very well documented, and we will continue to explore how poltergeist manifestations present themselves and the theory behind it. As we go through more case files, you will begin to see some common traits across poltergeist eruptions. There are some amazing observations from parapsychical investigations that, like Lombroso's work, help to solidify the theories that are used in poltergeist investigations to this very day. Thank you for your time spent walking in the shadows with me. I know your time is valuable, so I really appreciate you being here, in this moment. This episode was researched, written, and produced by me, Tim Woolworth. The audio wizardry is courtesy of our engineer and fellow explorer of the unknown, Joshua Sean at Zero G ITC. Hopefully this episode made a little bit of our paranormal world more normal for you. As always, if you have any personal anecdotes, observations, or alternate explanations you would like to share on this or any other topic we've covered, or just maybe you would like to drop a note to say hi, you can always reach us via our email, contact at walkintheshadows.com. Once again, that's contact, spelled C-O-N-T-A-C-T, at walkintheshadows.com. If you think what Walk in the Shadows offers is a valuable service for sating your paranormal curiosity, hit subscribe and review this podcast. And please, tell a friend. It really does help. If you want to learn more about this podcast or myself, please visit our Walk in the Shadows website. The link is in the show notes. On our website, you can find all of our social media accounts, our mailing list, and our Patreon should you decide to support us. Your support not only gives you benefits like ad-free content, bonus episodes, access to our Discord server, exclusive free merchandise, Ask Me Anything sessions, and much more. It also helps us keep high-quality paranormal content delivered regularly to the podcast player of your choice. Until next episode, may you and yours be healthy, prosperous, and treated with kindness by everyone you meet both in the light and in the shadows.